Maybe some tear gas ahead. Yes. I say to you this afternoon that I would rather down the highways of Alabama than make a butchery of my conscience. Yes, sir. I say to you as we march, don't panic and remember that we must remain true to nonviolence. I'm asking everybody in the line. If you can't be nonviolent, don't get in it. If you can't accept blows with that out retaliating, don't get in the line. If you can accept, accept it out of your commitment to nonviolence, you will somehow do something for this nation that may well save it. On the evening of December 1st, 1955, when I was arrested for refusing to stand up on the orders of a bus driver uh, for a white uh, male passenger to take the seat, he was the person who was contacted to come to my rescue. The, the, the first time we started marching was right after Mrs. Parks. Uh, bus incident and um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, King would always tell us that now we, we're gonna have a march and we're not gonna have any violence we're not gonna, if you got a hot temper then they would ask you not to march because people may throw rocks at you or they may spit on you or somebody may even hit you so you don't march you just walk and you sing and usually we would be singing uh, we shall overcome. And you know, I was just a young guy and not knowing the impact that the marching was gonna have on the nation. Uh, I can remember leaving Holt Street Baptist Church marching in the downtown Montgomery. Uh, that was a store which we used to call Cresses. So we get downtown from, from the church downtown, maybe about 30 minute walk and we get downtown the soda fountain is closed. The soda fountain is closed today. We ain't serving nobody today. All the chairs are turned. Well, they, they will have gotten the word that these marches are coming from Holt Street Church. And they, we were trying to integrate the facilities. And they had several little marches like that. And I can remember one march, I think we was marching to one of the stores in the downtown. And uh, that evening, I would guess around four or five o'clock, and they took about 30 or 40 of us and put us in a jail. We weren't inside. It was kind of like a, a, a recreation area by the police place. And so we were standing, had us all standing in this place, and we just standing there singing, we shall overcome. Five o'clock, we, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. And so we just singing. And so we were saying, oh my gosh, some of the older people, I mean, we young, I was young at that time. So, but somebody should be down here by now to bail us out because all, all they had to do was some of the officials like Dr. Nixon or someone would come and just bond us out. And so it was cold and uh, we started, stopped singing and because it's kind of cold, people kind of huddled up together. And so after we would gotten quiet for about 10 or 15 minutes, the guy, this white guy who was in charge, he said, all right, let's get that singing going on out there now. And we all started laughing because it was real funny to us how he told us, let's get that singing going on. That's one incident that I always remember about the marching. And, and when we were marching as young kids, and we never did know that the impact that it, this was gonna have, even with the Selma march for the voting, people didn't really know the impact that it was gonna be. And the only thing we were trying to do was to get public attention because we knew that the, the president was trying to do the Voting Rights Act, but the Southern governors and the other politicians, they were against this. And the, the marching would be an excellent way to call attention to the world of how people are being treated in the U.S. And that's basically why they wanted to stage the march. And since Montgomery was the capital, then that the president should, I mean, not the president, but the, the governor should have taken more of a leading role in trying to help 
break down these particular barriers. And this is what the president was trying to do. Rather than just take an executive order, he was trying to encourage the various cities and the various states to do this themselves. But a lot of the southern states, they resisted. And as a result, the Selma March takes place. And as I indicated, the first two times that the marches took place, Dr. King was not involved in the march, but Dr. King's spirit was always in the march and other leaders was participating. A lot, of, a lot of the marches took place. It's impossible for Dr. King to have been in, in all these different cities and marches at the same time. And then the third, the third time they marched, that's when Dr. King had scheduled the march date and he had asked on public news and public TV that we get world, uh, 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 countrywide participation. So then people volunteered from all over the U.S., from Washington, from Boston, New York, Chicago, movie stars. And one uh, movie star that I remember was, uh, he was a black guy, Sidney Poitier. Yeah, he was one of the guys that I remember because, well, he was a black, uh, executive and a black movie star and everybody knew Sidney. It was just exciting to see a movie star like Sidney Poitier because you never would think that you would have seen a guy like that in person other than on TV. But a lot of other people were there. And may, may I explain now, these were not just black people. I guess around 70, 60 or 70 percent of the people that was marching from Selma, they were white people. They was from the north. They were also from the south. Some of them was from Montgomery. In other words, lots of people in the southern states, they wanted the, the barriers to be broken down about segregation, and a lot of them were participating in Dr. King, how are things shaping up now for tomorrow? Things are shaping up beautifully. We have people coming in from all over the country. I suspect that we will have representatives from almost every state in the Union, and naturally a large number of people from the state of Alabama. And we hope to see, and we plan to see, the greatest witness for freedom ever taken place, that has ever taken place on the steps of the capital of any state in the South. And this whole march adds drama to this total thrust. As an African American, Knowing the knowledge of our history is essential for our overall well-being. The foundation that was placed before us is relevant because it demonstrates the courage and empowerment that we are capable of as blacks. Because we are exposed and have more access at hand, we should take advantage of it, especially the opportunities that we have to network with different individuals with authority. Black history stands for the honoring of African Americans who play a major role in society to obtain equality as human beings. What do I consider black history? I consider black history more than slavery. I consider black history more than the famous inventors. I, can, I consider black history more than the actors of our time that are getting Grammys, getting uh, Golden Globes, getting rewards for all their uh, achievements. I see black history as what you did yesterday. How did you impact somebody? Did you make somebody smile? Did you help somebody out with some work? Have, did uh, somebody need a ride to the store and did you give them one? I see black history as being a positive impact on people. I see that when, when we're moving forward, every, everything is a history. From the text message that you sent to the Instagram post that you posted, that is now your history. And I see that with black history, we, we, we get kind of skewed, we get caught up on slavery and all the abuse, but we forget to see the positive sides. We forget to see that there are, were the Rosa Parks, there were the Martin Luther Kings, there were the Jesse Jacksons out there that were doing positive things for us and making things happen. I see it as we, we are one. We are a team, but we forget that we are a team.